Hello everybody, I'm back, and now we're going to be looking at uh, two population proportions. So, we're slowly making our way through this module 10. It's a big module. There's a lot of different types of these two population tests. This is our last section here, so hopefully it hasn't been too much for you. Hopefully it's been just enough. Luckily you can skip things and fast forward things, and probably, probably doing a lot of fast forwarding. Let's get into this problem and you'll see how fairly similar it is to other problems that we've done. You know, the, the, the process of hypothesis testing, it hasn't changed. Here there's going to be one small little difference that results again from an assumption that we've been making from the beginning of hypothesis testing, which is always that assumption that the null hypothesis is true until we have evidence to show otherwise. <clears throat> and that assumption is going to come into some of our calculations here. Okay, let's get into it. Tourism plays an important role in the local economies of many small towns because tourism can be very difficult to, uh, industry to define. It's made up of so many smaller activities. You know, if we're looking at dining or, or different types of movies or golfing or mountain biking or boating, all these different activities make up tourism industries. We'll often use hotel occupancy rates uh, as a rough measure of the industry's overall performance. The following table provides hotel occupancy data for your hometown during the month of August for the uh, past two consecutive years. So, Formulate a test to determine if occupancy rates have increased. So that is telling us, I hope, quite clearly what kind of test we're supposed to be doing. So again, you know, I always want to emphasize that when you're doing these problems, either for an assignment or for an exam or something like this, you're not going to be told exactly what kind of test it is that you're supposed to be doing. You'll have to figure that out for yourself. And so when I'm looking at this data, First of all, I know that this is a test on proportion because the way that the data is given is, is in terms of a, a, let's call it a number of yes responses or a number of, of, of responses that meet some criteria. So what I'm saying here, we're, we're talking about hotels and how many hotels um, are occupied. And so here I have those yes responses. Is the hotel room occupied? Yes or no. And so what this is telling me is I have 1,535 occupied, occupied rooms. So that's the yes response out of a total number of rooms. So this is giving me uh, one of my sample proportions. I'm not going to identify if this is proportion one or two yet because of course that plays a role remember how we define our populations that plays a role in how we set up our tests so I'm not going to set uh, define those quite yet similarly we have for last year there's the number of yes responses right whatever it is that meets that criteria which in this example is an occupied room out of 1650 so Again, we can see out of some total amount, here's how many satisfy some criteria. And that criteria changes, of course, depending on the context of the problem. Here we're looking at the criteria being, was the room occupied, yes or no? So that again, that gives me another proportion. So, so this is telling me I have uh, two proportions. Now, what kind of test are we going to be doing? Because again, when we set this up, as our null and our alternative. Well, it's always going to be population one minus population two. And here I'm dealing with proportions. And so I do not want to see students writing mu because that symbol, Greek letter mu, that has a meaning that you can think of that as a word, right? That word, that symbol means the population average. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm not doing a test on averages. And so if you were a student in my class, I would actually mark that as incorrect, that the formulation of the test is wrong because you're using the wrong words. The word that I want to use here is P. That's the symbol that we use for proportion. 
And so here this is going to be P1 minus P2. What kind of test is it? I want to see how those occupancy rates increased. So when I hear that word increased, to me, that sounds an awful lot like an upper tail test. Is something getting bigger? Is it larger than? Has it increased? So I'm going to set this up as an upper tail test. So I'm going to define it like this. But of course, I haven't actually defined my terms yet. I'm setting it up as an upper tail test because I see this word here increased. And so that is, of course, reflected in my alternative hypotheses. But that is only correct if I allow this year to be population one and last year to be population two. So based on those definitions, an upper tail test is correct. And because we have this hypothesized value of zero, I'm actually just going to write this like that. Let's get rid of this. And let's just go like that. It just looks cleaner than having the, the subtraction and then the inequality with the zero. So we understand when I write it like this that our hypothesized value is, in fact, zero. Okay, so we've got our test. Um, you know, generally speaking, I always want my students to, to rationalize or justify or defend that test formulation. So if I have it formulated like this, if our evidence supports the null hypotheses, well then what that implies is that we do not have any evidence to show that hotel occupancy rates have increased. If our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well now I do have evidence to show that occupancy rates have increased between August of this year and August of last year. Good. Calculate our test statistic. Okay, so the test statistic here is going to be similar. It's going to be familiar. We're going to be using, just like we did in module 9, when we were looking at single population tests on proportions, there are some fairly straightforward, fairly minor uh, sample size requirements for us to use the Z distribution when working with proportions. All of the problems that we looked at in module nine all met those fairly simple, fairly um, small requirements for sample size. So we always use the Z distribution. We're gonna do the same thing with two populations. We'll always be working with samples of sufficiently large size and proportions that are sufficiently large so that we can always use the Z distribution. So our, our test statistic is going to look something like this. But where we're going to see a difference is in our standard error. Now, remember, when we're doing tests, we always assume that the null is true with equality, unless we have evidence to show otherwise. So when we make this assumption about the null, that our two values, in this case, our two proportions are no different, well, what that means then, of course, is that if P1 is equal to P2, given that assumption that we make, the methodological approach to our testing here is that we're assuming that these are equal. If P1 is equal to P2, well, then they're equal to some common population proportion. So I'm not writing a third proportion, I'm just deleting that subscript, because if they're the same, then I don't really need to distinguish between them. So for the purpose of our test, we need a estimate of that common population proportion. So there's a different ways that you can go about doing this. Typically, the, the, most, um, the most common is to use a, a weighted average. Uh, of your of your proportion. So this or a pooled estimator, they would call it a pooled estimator of your um, population proportion. And so that's going to be P bar is N1 P bar 1 and 2 P bar 2 divided by N1 and 2. 
And so given the data that we have here, well, I can just write this out. I haven't calculated p bar one or p bar two yet. And really it doesn't matter so much because if I write this out and I say, okay, here's our, our n1, right? And there's our n2. So that's going to be 1840 times that p bar one, well, that would just be 1535 divided by 1840. And our next one here, and two, so that's 1650 times p bar two, well, that would just be 1332 divided by 1650. And then of course we divide that by the total number of observations. So what I hope you can see here is that even though I haven't calculated p bar one and p bar two, I don't, I don't really need to because when I calculate here that pooled estimator, well, here I can see that those are just going to cancel out. And what I'm left with is just 1535 plus 1332 divided by 1840 and 1650. So what we can see here, I think is hopefully clear at how we are assuming that there's no difference between population one and population two, P1 and P2. Because here I'm just simply looking at the number of positive responses, those that meet the criteria in this case is the room occupied, as a percentage of, or as a fraction of, the total number of responses. So we're no longer distinguishing in this calculation we're no longer distinguishing between whether we're talking about uh, this year or last year. It's just looking at the total proportion of occupied rooms. So this is going to give me, let's see, 1535 plus 1332 divided by 1840 and 1650. So that gives me a proportion of 0.8. Eight, two. Let's keep it to three decimals that'll round to eight two two. Okay, so here we're a step ahead of ourselves here. So for our standard error, this is just simply going to be the square root of that pooled estimator, that one that we just calculated. So that's our pooled estimator times one minus that pooled estimator over 1 over n1 and 1 over n2. Okay, so now we can go ahead and put in our values. So here I need for my numerator p bar 1. Okay, well here I need that p bar. It'll make things maybe a little bit easier. So this is 0.80. 834 minus p bar 2, which is, whoops, 1332 is 0 0.807 divided by square root 822. One minus, and here's our samples one over eighteen forty and one over sixteen fifty. Okay, so we can go ahead with those calculations minus point eight oh seven, so that's going to give me zero two seven divided by. 0 0.0, well, round it again to three decimals just to try to maintain some level of precision. And so that gives me a Z score of 2.08 or 7.7. And the rest is, of course, the same as always. Now we go to our Z tables.
So if I scroll down, I should have some Z tables here. And I find my Z score negative 2.07. That gives me a P value of 0 0.019. So coming back up to our problem here, the corresponding P value 0 0.019. And we're doing this test at the O5 level of significance. So with a p-value, certainly that is less than our level of significance alpha. We have fairly strong evidence here to reject that null hypothesis, which means Again, always focusing on interpreting our conclusions, we have fairly strong evidence to show that occupancy rates uh, between August of last year and August of this year, they have in fact increased. Okay, so that's all there is to it. I say that as if it was so simple. But I hope that you do see the similarities here. And, and what we have done, the process is so, so, so similar. In this exercise, really the only little thing that is different for us is calculating this pooled estimator, which again is the result of this assumption that we've been using throughout all of the practice problems that we assume the null is true with inequality unless we have our evidence to show otherwise. And so this is the consequence of that assumption. And that assumption follows us through all of our calculations. But then once we have our Z scores, we get the p-value, we draw our conclusion, we state our interpretation. It all sounds very repetitive. So you'll all be masters in no time. So that's it for this video. We'll come back. We'll do a couple of more examples. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope it was helpful. Bye-bye.